Hey everyone, real quick before we get into today's video, I wanted to talk about Chilling, the awesome horror app I'm partnered with. In case you haven't heard, every week I have new stories that release over on Chilling. There are now over a thousand stories on Chilling, with a bunch of other YouTube narrators and professionals to choose from. On Chilling, you can do things that you've never been able to do on YouTube. You can choose from over a thousand individual stories that are sorted into curated playlists, or you can create your own. On Chilling, we give you so much flexibility to listen the way you want. This includes a chilling, game-changing feature, our ambient menu. You can change the background sounds of the story at any time to fit your mood. Go from rain to a campfire with the press of a button. It's totally revolutionary and you need to try it. There have been a number of awesome updates to Chilling, such as the ability to download stories for offline listening and the new social feature, as you can now discuss your favorite stories with other users and friends. And we're just getting started. Not only are we adding hours of new content every week, but original video content is also in the works. Chilling is evolving into a must-have for all horror lovers. So feel free to head over and start your free trial over on Chilling and check out my personal playlist there. And don't forget, this month Chilling is also giving away another PS5 bundle. Just leave a review on Google Play or the App Store letting us know what you think. Click the link in the description for more details on how to enter. So, I play amateur football here in Montana, and I've played for a couple of different teams now, but this one game I played back in 2014 ended really, really badly for me. I ended up getting my bell rung, which was bad enough, but when I woke up and tried to move, what I can only describe as the worst pain of my life just shot up through my leg. I hear one of the guys near me say something like, Oh my Jesus Christ, dude, look at his leg so I knew that it must have been pretty bad. But what I didn't realize was that it was a complete compound fracture that had taken almost a full year to heal. My tibia had torn right out through the meat of my skin, meaning I needed to be rushed into surgery or I might have actually lost my leg. Then once that whole process was out of the way, I needed some serious rehab in order to get back on my feet. I put on a bunch of weight, ended up getting hooked on pain meds for a while, which was a whole other drama. I basically became a totally different person over the course of about six or seven months. I was probably at the lowest point of my life so far, and I knew it was going to be a hard road to get back to playing football again. But my first goal was to lose the weight and gain back the strength in my legs that I needed for harder forms of training. Trouble was, I felt seriously embarrassed getting back in the gym which I know was kind of, of a dumb issue that was completely in my head, but it felt pretty real to me at the time. So I opted for another kind of exercise to get me back into shape, and that was hiking. My hiking spot of choice ended up being this one particular trail in the Beaverhead Deer Lodge National Forest, which is about 30 miles or so south of my hometown of Butte. I drive down to this little town called Wise River, park my truck near this awesome little saloon whose owner I got pretty friendly with, then I try hiking up to Round Top Mountain, getting further and further to the summit with every try. Between the buck and change in weight that I put on and my weak shin, it was absolute agony at first. I remember this one time when I was sitting down on a log at the side of the trail, pouring Advil down my neck and feeling like a complete piece of trash. I looked up the trail, way up, and saw this log cabin sitting there on a ridgeline, looking all lofty and king-like and staring out over the valley. I told myself, I'm going to make it up to you one day, and when I do, I'm going to drink from my water bottle like it's champagne. That became my goal over the summer, make it all the way up to that cabin on the ridge, as surely by that point my leg would be back to normal, and I'd be back to my usual 190 pounds. So, that was me, for almost the whole month of July, hiking up round top at least twice a week and feeling it get a little bit easier each time. Then one day, I finally did it. And my god, seeing that cabin up close and personal came with a feeling of pure elation. 
Only thing was, I'd completely sank the contents of my water bottle by the time I'd reached it, and since it'd be at least another hour of a hike back to my truck, I figured that I might as well see if the owners had an outside faucet or something that I could use to fill up my bottle. So I start walking up the trail, then turn off to walk up the path that leads to the cabin. Then as soon as I got within earshot, I can hear someone singing on the inside. That was kind of a relief to know someone was home, and I'd definitely get some water. I wasn't worried if I'd be welcome or not, as someone singing that loud to themselves would sound like a happy kind of tune, I doubted that they'd be grumpy enough to turn away a stranger asking for water, especially on such a hot summer's day. I get right up close to the front door of the cabin, and inside the man was still singing a song, and to this day, I remember almost exactly what the lyrics were. Baby's packed her soft things and she's left me, and I know she didn't mean to make me cry. It's not her heart, it's not her mind. She didn't mean to be unkind. She even woke me up to say goodbye. I looked it up later, and it's from a Jerry Lee Lewis song called She Even Woke Me Up to Say Goodbye. Kind of a bright country kind of sound to it, but the lyrics are much sadder than the tune lets on. The way the guy was singing it all loud and stuff, he was either in sort of a good mood or really drunk, and both would probably lead me to getting a drink of water. Next thing, I knock on the guy's door and announce myself, but then he doesn't respond in any way, so I figured that he might have had earbuds or headphones on or something. The door to the cabin is slightly ajar, something which I noticed after knocking on it, so while half praying that he didn't freak out and shoot me or something, I edged the cabin door open to look inside and maybe give him a wave to let him know I was there. I push the door open, and I see the little kitchen and dining room is empty, with the singing coming from the bedroom now. Somehow, the guy hadn't heard me, but that made sense considering the whole place stunk of really strong booze. But then there was something else in the air, something that smelled almost metallic. Before I had a chance to really think on what it was, the owner of the cabin appears shirtless from the bedroom area, carrying a jug of what looked like moonshine or some other kind of home brew. But he wasn't drinking it. He was splashing it all over the floor for some reason, and when he locks eyes with me, he had this kind of oh crap look on his face that made me very, very nervous. Then right as I'm backing out from the open doorway, I see why he looks so frightened about being disturbed. In the corner of the small room, there was a woman sitting slumped on the floor, with her back to the wall, and above her is this smear of blood like she just slid down the wall after being stabbed or shot or something. I turned to run, just not really thinking about it, just knowing that I wanted to get out of there. But instead of running the way I came, which would have made for an easy shot should the guy have pulled a gun out or something, I go running through the trees at the side of the house for more cover. Keep in mind, I can't exactly run properly at this stage. My shin is still hollering at me something fierce, so if I had gone off running the way of the trail, the guy would have been able to just line me up in his sights and shoot me down like shooting fish in a barrel. My fears were confirmed when I heard this gunshot go off behind me, and somehow that got rid of the pain in my leg almost instantly. Adrenaline is one heck of a drug it turns out. I almost went tumbling down the slopes a bunch of times and I think I just skidded down on my butt for most of it, but I eventually got to a point where I felt like it was safe enough for me to pull out my cell phone to try and call 911. I was able to tell the cops about the body, about the shot that I thought was fired at me, how the guy looked like he was about to burn his place down so they better get there quick. But then there is no fast way of getting up a steep hill like Round Top and by the time the cops got there, I think the place was fully ablaze. I think that was the case anyways. I mean, I could see the smoke all the way from my car when I hiked back there, and after I drove back home, I only got the full story when the cops came to talk to me about exactly what I'd seen. They think the guy had gone through his wife's phone or something and found out that she was cheating, and then he flew into a rage and shot her. Only, what I didn't see was that he'd shot his two kids too, and he'd stacked their bodies on the bed before dousing the place in what the cops also believed was some kind of homemade liquor. After that, 
He didn't come out to take a shot at me. He just walked outside his burning cabin and shot himself in the head. That was the shot that I heard, the one that made me run like hell. It made for a real open and shut case from what I can tell. Not much to investigate, not many questions to ask, just a whole lot of insaneness that's better left forgotten about, I suppose. But then, what if I can't forget about it? What if every time I look south, up at the hills, I think about the way he was just singing to himself after that guy had taken his own kids' lives? I just don't get why he wanted to make them victims of a situation that was so messed up to begin with. How can a person feel that entitled to the lives of their own children? Like I said, I think I've come to the depressing conclusion that good things are only fleeting. But then, seeing something like that I did up there on Round Top, those bad things I was talking about, they have a habit of staying with you for much longer than anyone might like them to. One of the worst days of my life started when me and a hiking buddy of mine came across this run-down old hunting cabin out in the woods. I mean, it was so shabby looking that we couldn't have imagined it being anything but abandoned, so we didn't see any harm in exploring it a little before we moved back onto the trail that we'd been wandering down. We walk inside, start looking around, only to see that it didn't look that abandoned at all. The stove had clearly been in use some time in the last day or so, as it still smelled like burning wood and there were a couple of food wrappers strewn about with what looked like some torn open first aid supplies. Someone had definitely been there recently, so instead of continuing our little trespassing thing, we decided to just move on instead of risking making their owner angry or whatever. But then, that's when we hear this really faint noise coming from somewhere, something that sounded an awful lot like a person's voice. I look at my buddy as if to say, you hear that? Then we both stand real still for a second and strain our ears, only to hear a distinct, help me, coming from underneath us. This hit us like a ton of bricks, and we start looking around for some kind of hatch or something, and end up finding the opening to a root cellar outside. We open it up to find some random guy, covered in blood, with what we thought was a gunshot or stab wound to one of his legs. I remember asking the guy, what happened to you? And his reply was honestly one of the most haunting things I've ever heard in my life. He just said, you have to help me. He'll be back soon. Jesus, dude. It was like something out of a horror movie. Like that stomach dropping moment you realize that main characters have stumbled into a whole world of trouble. Only, we were the main characters and it wasn't some dumb story that we were going to survive with a happy ending. It was real, and we had no idea what to do next. We kept asking like, who will be back? Who did this? But the guy just kept begging us to help him get out of the cellar. Obviously, that was the first thing we did, as he basically answered our questions in the way that he was all messed up and obviously scared of whoever was coming back. We helped him out of that cellar, got one of his arms over each of our shoulders then helped him limp down the trail back towards where we'd first walked onto. No one ever caught up with us. The person who had shot or stabbed him never ran down the trail behind us. But my god, the whole time I was checking behind us just expecting to see some machete-wielding psycho running out of the woods intent on killing us. We managed to flag down a truck that was passing down one of the main roads that ran through the park and The guy was nice enough to rush the dude to the hospital, even though he'd gotten blood all over his upholstery. Turned out the guy survived, and that the person who had attacked him was his hunting buddy, who just snapped after some kind of argument. It's crazy that a person would do something like that to someone they called a friend, but I guess weirder things have happened. Definitely the scariest thing that's ever happened to me while out on a hike, and my buddy says the same thing. It was that line of, He'll be back soon, that I'll never forget though, how it was just so eerie that it literally had me trembling with fear as we helped the guy get to safety, and I sometimes wonder how close we were to getting the same treatment, that maybe if we had been a little bit earlier or later, 
the guy might have done the same thing to us, just to keep us quiet. So, back when me and my big brother were still fairly young, our parents weren't exactly very well off. Mom had been out of regular work for more than two years due to the childbirths and needing to take care of us, and my dad was still basically at entry level for his career. But because they worked so hard on carving out a life for us as a family, they were in dire need of a vacation. Only thing was, because of our financial situation it had to be a real budget vacation, which is how they found this cheap log cabin in the Cascades that was available for just over a hundred bucks a week. From what they've told us, it wasn't like it was one of those too-good-to-be-true kind of deals. There wasn't anything remotely suspicious about a place so rough around the edges. But from what the owner told them, it was quiet, secluded, and well off the beaten path, so the perfect place to get some peace and quiet away from the hustle and bustle of Seattle. I think all it took was making sure it was safe for kids, ensuring that there were no bodies of water around or anything, and then they went ahead and booked it for five days in June or July. I was really into animals and nature stuff back then, still am really, and my brother was a pretty chill kid so they could have taken him anywhere and he'd have found something to keep himself occupied. So when we arrived out at the cabin, we were both pretty excited with our new surroundings, even if it meant that we had to share a bed in a small rustic looking one room cabin. We didn't care if it was too small or if it was in the middle of nowhere. It was like a real adventure to us at that age. Being so immersed in nature was something I found really exciting. The first day, we arrived in the early afternoon and I remember running around the cabin with my mom before she took me and my brother out to explore the surrounding area. We had a small dinner that my dad cooked on the stove with groceries we'd bought and then we ended up playing board games until it was time for bed. Everything was perfectly normal for that first day, and it was only during the night that I noticed something seemed to be off. I remember waking up in the middle of the night to find that my dad was out of bed and was over by the small window near the cabin's front door. Mom was sat up in bed, whispering to him in the low light. My brother stayed fast asleep as I asked them what was wrong and why dad was out of bed. I remember both of them kind of jumping when I spoke, but... I did surprise them, so that figured. They told me dad couldn't sleep, how the bed was too small or something, so he was just letting mom get some sleep before he went to bed himself. I do remember thinking that was kind of weird, as the bed looked big enough for me, but at that age, kids just kind of take their parents' word over stuff like that, don't they? So as they continued to whisper to each other in the darkness, which I actually found very soothing even though I shouldn't have, I just went back to sleep. The next morning, mom and dad were sat at the little table looking all worried and stressed about something. I could tell something was wrong, even at that age, but I was still excited to be on vacation, and I was definitely excited to get back into the great outdoors to try to spot some animals. I asked if I could play outside, and my parents said it was okay, just as long as I didn't go anywhere they couldn't see me from the window. If I couldn't see the window, I'd gone too far, and that's what they told me. So I opened up the cabin door, walked outside, and on the edge of the porch was what looked like this little figurine. It was shaped like a tiny little man, and to me, it looked like it had been carved out of wood or something. I remember picking it up and playing with it for a little while, making the little guy run through the grass and jump out onto logs and stuff. Then the next thing I know, I saw one sitting on the hood of mom and dad's car, so... Naturally, I ran over to grab that one too, so I had two little stick men to play with. I was in the middle of my little game when my brother came outside. He's older than me, and back then he was definitely more attuned to mom and dad's moods. He told me something was wrong with them, that they seemed worried or sad about something, which made me sad too because it was supposed to be a happy little vacation for us, an adventure, just like they'd said. I remember being it much harder to have fun after that knowing that mom and dad were stressed or whatever, but still, I showed my brother the new toys I had and invited him to play along with me. I gave him one of the little figurines, but then he kept asking to play with the other one too, and it wasn't long before a childish scuffle started between him and me, and he attempted to wrestle the little figure out of my hand. It didn't take long before I started to cry, 
and that then prompted our mom and dad to come running out of the cabin at the sound of my cries. I don't remember them running out with any particular urgency, but years later they told us that the sound absolutely terrified them, especially in light of what had happened the night before. They asked what we were fighting over, and that's how they discovered the little white figures we'd been playing with. But right when my dad took them from my big brother, he immediately started asking us all frantically, where did you get these? Tell me where. He was so angry that my brother started crying too and just pointed at me while he said that it was me that had found them. I was already upset, but I remember getting even more upset once I realized that we might be in trouble for having played with them. I told mom and dad exactly where I'd found them, that they'd just been sitting there and how I hadn't stolen them or taken them from any other kid or anything. It seemed totally harmless to me, just playing with little wood carved figures. I had no idea that they weren't made of wood at all. The next thing I remember, mom and dad had rushed us back into the cabin, then weirdly changed their approach as they reassured us that we weren't in any trouble, that we hadn't done anything wrong, and that they weren't mad at us at all. Mom proceeded to comfort me and my brother, but then I noticed how dad was packing all of our stuff back into our suitcases at like 100 miles an hour. He was the same way, making sure to put on a brave face as he got us ready to get out of there. And then they both explained that they had to take us home early because dad needed to go back to work on something. I can't remember the exact excuse, but they promised us that it wasn't because we'd misbehaved or anything, and we could carry on playing in the backyard when we got home. I asked if we could take the little figures home with us, and both of them almost snapped at me when they said no right at the same time. Again, I associated this with me having done something wrong, as the whole episode seemed to be centered around the two white carvings. Within maybe 10 or 15 minutes, I'm not sure, but I know it was fast, we were back in the car and driving back to Seattle again, with this real tense mood in the car as we drove. It was still pretty tense for the rest of the day, but then the next, Mom took us out into the small backyard that we had and told us that we could have our very own little nature play session right there. It was only a small backyard, but we still had fun watching for birds and we were in the suburbs at the time, so just seeing the odd squirrel made me and my brother so excited. Then we had a little picnic, ran around the grass in the sun, and within a day, all the trouble back at the cabin was forgotten about among me and my brother. So, cut to like 20 years later. It's during the holiday, and me and my brother had come home to have Christmas dinner. We're sitting around reminiscing in the TV room, talking about this and that, when my brother suddenly brings up the aborted cabin vacation from when we were kids. He hadn't forgotten about the two little figures, but he wasn't entirely sure if I had stolen them or not, or why mom and dad seemed to get so weirdly mad about me finding and playing with them. Mom and dad gave each other this look as if to say, here goes. Then I remember dad being like, shall you tell them or shall I? Mom just shook her head and covered her face with her hands like she couldn't bear to remember the whole thing. That's when dad launches into the actual story of what happened back then, a story that I'll share with you too. So, remember I mentioned waking up in the middle of the night and seeing Dad out of bed, and he and my mom were whispering to each other in the low light? That was because, as they were drifting off to sleep, Dad had heard someone moving around outside the cabin. Not like just walking by, either. The footsteps were slow and careful, like whoever it was didn't want to be heard. That's how Dad ended up peering out of the window so late at night, and although I didn't see it at the time... He had this old kitchen knife in his hand, just waiting for someone to burst through the door. That had scared them both pretty badly, but they didn't want to just bail on the vacation they'd already paid for, the one they both felt that they needed so badly. So although they were in two minds about it, they decided to stay one more night just to make sure that it wasn't some kids messing around or something. If it happened again, they were just going to leave, but they didn't even get that far because right around the same time that they were discussing whether to stay another night, the incident with the little figurines happened. Remember me telling you how they looked like they were carved from wood, but that the wood was all pale, like almost white? It wasn't wood at all, and my dad almost instantly recognized that the little figurines were made of bone. 
I'm not going to pretend to know which bone or what kind of animal they came from. I mean, God forbid they came from a person or whatever. But like I said, Dad was smart enough to recognize the texture and realize that whoever had been outside the previous night must have left them there, maybe even as a warning. I mean, you don't leave bone figurines on someone's porch as a welcome gift, do you? Not in the middle of the night, anyway. So instead of sticking around like they thought they might, they just, as they say, noped out of there. Like my dad figured that he could protect my family from some lone peeping Tom, but from someone who carved stuff out of bone to leave his creepy gifts, that wasn't anyone he wanted to go up against. Personally, I think that that was a smart move, and I respect them for making the hard decision that they had to. Now, 90% of horror movies are the dumb teens just not taking the hint about being somewhere that they're not supposed to be. But in real life, when you have your kids around to protect, there's no thinking it over at all when stuff like that hits the fan. You just get out of there and don't look back. Every fall, I take me and my family out to a cabin in the woods up in Maine. Don't let the whole cabin in the woods thing fool you. It's a very bougie kind of experience, and although my kids would roll their eyes at me using that word, I don't think they'd be quite so pleased with the place if it wasn't for how upmarket it actually is. It has a hot tub outside, a full kitchen, pretty spectacular internet for rural Maine, but I think my favorite part has to be the cozy TV area with its fireplace and sliding glass door. The glass doors face out west, and because the cabin is built in a clearing at the crest of a gentle slope, the sunsets are absolutely incredible. Paying for a hot tub is one thing, but seeing the way the setting sun lights up the reddy orange leaves and makes them look like they're on fire, that's something that money can't buy right there. But by some horrid twist of fate, those sliding glass doors ended up being part of one of the scariest things I'd ever seen with my own two eyes. They both protected us and presented us with something so horrifying that I don't think I'll ever get it out of my mind. And every time we visit that luxurious log cabin up in Maine, it pops into my mind at some point, and it's guaranteed to make me shudder. We're going back more than 10 years for this, all the way back to 2010 when my daughter was still in middle school and my son was just only out of diapers. Me and my wife had just put my son to bed and my daughter was in her room playing the Nintendo thing that we just gotten her for her birthday. So for the first time all that day, me and my wife were just enjoying each other's company in the TV room, watching the sunset and sharing a bottle of wine. We're just gazing out the glass doors, silently basking in the fact that we'd overcome so much to be where we were, when suddenly, a dog comes into view. It looked like a mongrel of sorts, as just lazily wandering into our view before stopping and letting its tongue loll out of its mouth in the way that dogs do. My wife said something like, Ah, look at that little guy. You think he's lost? But the dog seems to hear her talk and returns its head in our direction. That's when I noticed that there was something not quite right about it. Its ribs were showing, which made me think it was a stray, but I also noticed those flecks of white spittle around its mouth, some of it matted into the fur at the corners of its jaws. My wife, being the kind-hearted soul that she is, as if we should maybe give the poor thing some food and a bowl of water, since she too thought that it looked like a stray. She was halfway around to getting up off the couch when I just gently put a hand on her thigh and asked her to sit back down. She acted like I was being some sort of Scrooge, not wanting to feed and water a starving animal. But when I told her that I thought the dog might have rabies, she suddenly understood why I didn't want her opening the glass doors. After she sat back down, I got up to take a closer look at the thing, just to make sure that I wasn't being overly protective or paranoid. But just as I got near the glass, the dog suddenly began baring its teeth and began snarling so loud we could hear it through the thick glass of the sliding doors. I immediately froze in fear, amazed that even though it looked like nothing more than a domesticated dog, its anger could have such a profound effect on me. It looked truly ferocious like it actually wanted to rip my throat out. And I realized how fortunate we are that most dogs have the friendly disposition that made them man's best friend. 
Rather than antagonize it any further, I tried to just back off away from the glass doors, intending to find my phone so I could call animal control or something. But then the second I had turned to show my back, it began bounding towards us, something I'd never have known about if it wasn't for my wife shouting, oh my god, at the top of her lungs. I turned just in time to see the dog's face colliding with the glass door, and it made such an ungodly thudding sound that it makes my skin crawl just to think about today. The impact drew another frightened cry from my wife, which in turn had my daughter running into the room to see what had caused it. In that moment, my priority was getting my daughter out of the room so that she wouldn't have to see what was happening. It was extremely distressing, even for us grown adults, so I can only imagine how disturbing it must have been for her. Just seeing the slight smear of blood on the glass and the dog walking in a dazed circle outside while yelping and hacking enough was to cause her to burst into floods of confused, frightened tears. And although I was sorry to do it, I had to yell at her to get her out of the room again. My next priority was obviously animal control, as I was never really afraid that the thing was going to break through the glass, certainly not after that first attempt, which seemed to have completely stunned the poor thing. But after that, while I dialed an operator and asked them to connect me with local animal control, I watched in horror as the dog tried to literally bite its way through the glass. It was raking its teeth against it, its fat, swollen tongue lolling out the whole time. And that's when I realized that it wasn't so much that it was just hot or thirsty. Its tongue was just so big and swollen to actually sit in its mouth properly. Blood was leaking out of its nostrils from the impact against the glass, with more smearing over it as it continued to try to bite its way inside. It still looked furious, like it would most likely attack us if it did somehow manage to break through, but at the same time, a look would come into its eyes every so often that to me looked so much like desperation that broke my heart. It was like it was silently crying out to us, help me, please help me, where there was nothing we could do. I'm not the type to keep a gun in the house, and even if I was, I'm not sure I have the heart to shoot an animal like that, no matter how much it's suffering. All I could do was wait for the animal control officer to call us back, as he wasn't picking up his phone immediately and then tell him where exactly we were and what condition we'd seen the dog. It had wandered off long before the call came, but my wife had barely managed to calm herself in that time. I can't say that I've done a better job either, as, like I said... The whole thing was one of the single most horrifying things I'd ever been witness to. In the years that followed, my daughter became a huge fan of the TV show The Walking Dead, and I was always surprised that she didn't make the connection between the virus and the show and what she'd seen back at the cabin that day. Naturally, we had to explain to her that the dog was rabid, how dangerous a disease it was, and how she should learn to recognize symptoms of such animals so she could get away from them. Personally, I find it fascinating that people like her take an interest in a fictional zombie apocalypse and talk about it like it's an impossibility. We have a zombie virus here on Earth. It actually exists. Something that can turn animals and maybe people into furious, foam-frothing creatures that can pass on their disease through their bites. We don't have to imagine it. We don't have to invent it. It's real. It's with us. And that one little fact scares the absolute crap out of me. Christmas of 1990 was supposed to be a truly joyous occasion for the Salt Lake City-based Tita family. 20-year-old Lene Tita and her 16-year-old sister Trish were particularly looking forward to visiting the family's cabin up in the mountains, where they and their extended relatives would gather every year to celebrate the holidays. The cabin was nestled at the bottom of Weber Canyon, near a place called Oakley, and was so far away from many main roads that the family had christened it T-Day's Tranquility, due to the peace and solitude that could be found there. The place was so isolated that during heavy winter storms, the cabin was completely cut off from the outside world and could only be accessed via snowmobile. Naturally, this made it the perfect place to get away from the rat race of the big city, yet it would also leave the family extremely vulnerable to anyone with ill intentions who happened across the cabin while they were there. 
After turning the cabin into a picture of perfect Christmas coziness, the family headed into Salt Lake City in order to engage in some last-minute holiday shopping. Yet while they were gone, two men who had been trudging through the snowy wilderness suddenly stumbled across the cabin and decided to force their way inside. The men were named Vaughn Lester Taylor and Edward Stephen Deli, two parolees who had gone on the run from their halfway house a week earlier, the same halfway house they were supposed to be using as a base for job hunting. Edward had been sent to prison for five years back in 1989 following a conviction for arson, while Vaughn had been doing 15 years for aggravated burglary. After breaking into the cabin, the two men set about warming themselves up before pilfering some of the T-Day's family's food and drink. Then they found the family's video camera and recorded themselves ransacking the cabin, even going so far as to film themselves opening the family's Christmas presents while making a mockery of the holiday season. Vaughn believed that they would swiftly move on from the cabin for fear of getting caught, but to his surprise, Edward revealed that he had no intention of vacating Tita's tranquility. In fact, he planned to, as he phrased it, shoot some people. Later that day at around 3.30 p.m., Lene Tita, along with her mother and grandmother Beth and Kay Tita, returned to the cabin following their shopping trip. The snow was just light enough on the ground for them to have driven to and from Salt Lake City, so after parking up their vehicle, they walked inside the cozy cabin to warm their bones. But then as soon as they walked into the kitchen, their little slice of winter heaven turned into nothing short of pure hell. Lene Tita later said that from behind the refrigerator came a frizzy-headed man in a gray sweatshirt with his pistol pointed at me. As soon as my mom came to the top of the stairs, out from the back bedroom, another robber with really thick Coke bottle glasses on was pointing a gun at my mother. Lene also said that she believed that they were about to be robbed, but when her mother began praying aloud in the moments following the ambush, Vaughn Taylor told her the prayers wouldn't do any good, because he worshipped the devil and had come for their souls. At that, Vaughn pulled the trigger, executing Kay before shooting Beth in the head. Lene was both terrified and traumatized by what she had witnessed, but her horror only deepened when she realized that her father and sister would also be arriving back at the cabin in the next few minutes. She begged the invaders to leave, telling them that they were welcome to whatever they pleased, but it was far too late. Vaughn and Edward were reveling in the power they now wielded, lost in a haze of pure bloodlust, and as they heard Rolf and Trish Tita pulling into the driveway, they relished in the sadism of having two new victims. They ambushed the two unexpecting Titas as they exited their vehicle, dragging them into the cabin at gunpoint. My dad could see tears in my eyes, Lene later said, and it was an unspoken communication, and he knew, at that point, that something awful had happened to Mom and Grams. Edward and Vaughn made the trio kneel in the cabin's main room, then told the girls to watch as Edward aimed his pistol at Rolf Tita's head. That must have seemed like a sick joke as Edward first shot misfired, a dull click echoing around the room as the girls begged and screamed for mercy. Edward cleared the bullet from the chamber, then once again pulled the trigger, but yet again the gun misfired and failed to send the bullet flying down the barrel. It was almost as if divine intervention was at play, almost like a merciful deity had decided that there had been enough bloodshed at Tita's tranquility. But if there really was some kind of message being sent from the beyond, it was almost certainly lost on the two bloodthirsty felons. Edward Deli cleared the second stoppage from the chamber, racked a third and final round into his pistol, and fired. This time there was no failure to ignite the bullet's gunpowder, and the metal slug ripped through Rolf Tita's face, sending him crumpling into the carpet. After executing Rolf, the two home invaders found themselves a can full of gasoline, poured some of the contents over the man's lifeless corpse, then set it on fire. They then did the same to the rest of the cabin, dousing it in the flammable liquid as they forced the two surviving Tita girls to load up their snowmobiles with food and liquor. Then as the cabin burned, each of the men forced one of the girls out onto a snowmobile to ensure their compliance, then they took off through the snow. Tita's tranquility was certainly isolated, 
but the geography of Weber Canyon ensured that the sound of the gunshots echoed for a considerable distance. A distant neighbor had instantly recognized the ominous sound and had rushed outside to see the two snowmobiles driving off towards the horizon. Instinctually, knowing that something was horribly wrong, they had instantly contacted local law enforcement to inform them of the potential danger. 16-year-old Trish later stated that she was terrified that she and her sister would simply be executed once they got to a main road, so she frantically racked her brains for a means of escape. I had all kinds of different plans to wreck the snowmobile, Trish stated, of how to throw him off into a tree, how to get rid of him, but all I could think of is I couldn't leave my sister. There's no one to help us. There was nowhere to go. Then, by some stroke of pure luck, Trish and Lene spotted their Uncle Randy, who was out for a walk near the trail they were riding down. Assuming they were out taking some friends for a ride, Randy waved at them, not realizing that he was actually putting his own life in danger. Had the girls responded in any way, there's no doubt that either Edward or Vaughn would have opened fire on him, but in a display of remarkable composure for two girls their age, both Trish and Lene ignored his greeting and simply carried on riding through the snow towards the nearby highway. I knew his life could be in danger, Lene explained. I knew if these men knew Randy was her uncle, that they would have killed him. Edward and Vaughn then forced the girls to take them to one of the Tita's family's vehicles, which happened to be parked up by the highway in full view of their uncle Randy. They forced the girls into the back of the car, and as they took off, Randy watched in confusion as the girls refused to acknowledge his presence. At one point, Edward and Vaughn asked who the man waving at them was, but the girls denied all knowledge, stating that he must have been an overly familiar neighbor who had no idea what was actually occurring. Yet as the car disappeared out of sight, another vehicle came into view. It was the Tita's third snowmobile, and the man who rode it was wearing no winter clothing of any kind, and had a face that was a mess of blood and charred flesh. It was Rolf Tita, who had somehow survived what should have been fatal injuries. Uncle Randy later spoke of the encounter with a major TV network, saying Rolf's face was all swollen and caked with blood. One of his eyes was swollen shut and he actually had bloody icicles hanging from his face. It was that cold outside. He was in terrible shape. Rolf simply looked up at his terrified brother, then murmured the words, I've been shot, my wife has been killed, and my daughters have been kidnapped. It transpired that the clothes Rolf had been wearing when he was set alight had been completely flame retardant, and despite the amount of gasoline that had been poured on him, his outfit had slowed the spread of the flames so that when he woke up, he was able to pull them off his body before he was completely engulfed. The bullet fired into his face had somehow failed to damage his brain or sever his spinal column, so essentially, the shot had just knocked him out until the smell of the fire roused him from his unconsciousness. Then after waking up to find his cabin in flames, Rolf had jumped out onto the one remaining snowmobile, then raced after his attackers in a bid to rescue his two terrified daughters. Upon discovering his half-dead brother, Uncle Randy helped him into the passenger seat of his car before speeding off after the vehicle containing his nieces. Despite being a rare fixture in 1990, Randy's car was equipped with an old-style cellular phone, and as he and his brother raced after the girl's kidnappers, he made a hasty phone call to the Summit County Sheriff's Department. As sheriff's deputies joined the pursuit, a terrifying 90-mile-an-hour car chase ensued, as cops honed in on their kidnappers and ordered them to pull over. Instead of giving up willingly, Vaughn and Edward drove so recklessly that they ended up losing control of their vehicle and tumbling down an embankment. Miraculously, neither Trish nor Lene were injured in the crash, and as deputies surrounded the vehicle, both Edward and Vaughn decided it was better to give themselves up than risk dying in a hail of police gunfire. With Trish and Lene now safely in the care of law enforcement, 25-year-old Vaughn Taylor and 21-year-old Edward Delly were each charged with two counts of first-degree murder, one count of attempted first-degree murder, and two counts of aggravated kidnapping. At his trial in May of 1991, Vaughn Taylor pled guilty on the charge of murder and was sentenced to death just two weeks later. 
Edward Delhi, on the other hand, was only convicted of second-degree murder and received a lesser sentence of life in prison. A huge boon for the prosecution was the testimony of Rolf Tita himself, as Trish recalled in a press interview after the murderer's convictions. I remember watching the look on Edward's face as he came in seeing my father. It was very apparent to me that he did not know my father had survived, and the look on his face was priceless, like he had been defeated while my dad had survived. It was a moment of pure victory for us. A decade later in 2001, Edward Deli wrote a letter to Lene Tita, insisting that he was no longer the reckless young man who had helped murder her mother. Then, in an incredible display of mercy, Lene offered her forgiveness for his crimes, but added that she was glad that he would spend the majority of his life in prison. As for Von Taylor, he has continually pursued a number of appeals against his death penalty, arguing that it was Edward Deli who committed the murders and that he was surprised and appalled when his partner began killing. He has also argued that his death sentence should be commuted on account of an apparent brain deficiency, and that he was manipulated into taking part in the crime by the younger and more malevolent of the two. Shockingly, his persistent pleas were eventually successful, and in the year 2020, U.S. District Court Judge Tina Campbell announced that she was overturning Taylor's death sentence because he was not given an adequate defense from his public defender. The decision was met with outrage by the surviving members of the Tita family, and a massive public campaign saw the decision reversed just last year, when a federal appeals court placed Von Taylor back on Utah's death row. Today's ruling puts Taylor back on the road to justice, announced the state's assistant solicitor. But sadly, it does not end the case and permit Taylor's immediate execution. In the aftermath of such a heinous crime, Trish and Lene Tita have refused to let the horrors of that December afternoon shape their lives for the worse. The family made it a point of poignant memorial that Tita's tranquility was completely rebuilt and restored, and an effort was made to make new happy memories there as a way of exercising the bad ones. Sadly, Rolf Tita passed away from cancer just a few years ago, and his daughters eulogized him as nothing short of a hero to them. Yet this seems like a case of heroism recognizing heroism, as if it wasn't for the stoic actions of the girls on that fateful day, there's no doubt that more innocent people would have died at the hands of two evil and bloodthirsty maniacs who were intent on ruining one of the most sacred times of year. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, if it doesn't smell, it's Chewbacca. <laughs>